I'm not a Notre Dame fan. Um, I think Rudy, when it came out in the mid-1990s, uh, has become like in my top three of all time favorite sports movies because it tells the story of, of a guy who was one of 14 children. He was five foot six, weighed 135, 140 pounds, and should have never been out on that field. A lot of us have similar, I guess, stories about our own uh, athletic career, but when I saw that movie and then I read the story behind the story, uh, the movie did not depict this, but when he graduated from high school, he actually went into the Navy for two years, and then he worked in a factory for two years, and then he went to Holy Cross Community College, and then finally made it to Notre Dame. And he was there academically and trying to make the grades and things. And he became the only member of his family or the first member of his family up to that point to receive a college education. And so I, I start our time out together today to sort of give you a glimpse of what we're wanting to talk to, uh, to you about today, about wings like eagles. Uh, there, there's going to be people who tell you you can't, you shouldn't, you couldn't, and you wouldn't. But there's something on the inside of you that says, yes, I can. I, I, I'm going to continue to dream. I'm con going to continue to have visions in my life. We're going to be studying today out of the book of Isaiah. And the book of Isaiah, it's a beautiful story there in chapter 40. And it sort of gives two different prophecies. Uh, the first prophecy is that Isaiah addresses God's people who are going to undergo 70 years of Babylonian captivity. They would feel oppression by an aggressor, just like their forefathers did in Egypt long ago. But then there was a second prophecy, and it was addressed to spiritually captivated individuals who had been consumed by sin that were now in bondage, longing for freedom and victory. And when I was studying this past week and putting the final touches on my message yesterday, I said, this is where so many of our people are living today. They're wanting freedom, they're wanting victory, but they're not willing to do what is necessary in order to achieve that. And one thing I do know about the prophet Isaiah, he had a very difficult responsibility. It's similar today of my role as your pastor or any other preacher or teacher. Three different areas I want to look at. First of all, he was to speak and write to a hard-headed people. Not only hard heads here in Athens, but around the world, if you will, individuals that just won't listen. And they continue in a behavior that one day is going to come back on them. Paul wrote about this in the book of Romans chapter 2 and verse 5 when he says, But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Sometimes I'm having conversations um, in the community at large. Sometimes I'm in my office where someone's sitting on the uh, chair and the desk in front of me, and then they'll look at me and say, Joel, I know what you're saying is right, but I'm a hard head. I have a hard heart. I'm going to do what I want to anyway. These individuals are storing up a wrath that's going to one day come back and bite them, whether it's emotionally or spiritually, even sometimes physically. That we're doing things that's going to store up judgment that one day is going to come rolling downhill on top of us. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice. Now, I know sometimes you get tired of my voice, and I'm okay with that. I get tired of it as well. But I pray that you would go beyond my voice, and you would listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness sometimes because we are hard head we get a hard heart that happens over time maybe life has not treated you the way that you wanted it to maybe you've made some bad decisions in your past that has led to you in the present predicament that you're in so here we are don't harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion there's a second group of people he was to speak and write to an unmotivated people not only did they have a hard head and a hard heart they were unmotivated they were lazy Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 18, through sloth or laziness, the roof sinks in, and through idleness, the house leaks. There's always something that we need to do, but we don't do it. Why? Because we're lazy. We're unmotivated. Romans chapter 12, verse 11 says, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Now, hear me out. 
I don't think there's anything inherently sinful or wrong to go to the stadium of your favorite team and, man, holler and scream and cheer when they touch downs and sacks and all the things that are associated with what we're talking about on game day. But then if I come to God's house and I sit on my hands and do nothing and I don't open my mouth, which one's the idol? Which one is the God? So I think we have to really look in our own lives sometimes of what are we cheering, what are we celebrating, and what are we unmotivated about. Well, there is also a passage in Hebrews 6 that says, And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish. You, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you eat a big meal and you got to go out and do something, but you feel sluggish. The, the Hebrew writer says, so that you may not be sluggish, but the imitators of those who through faith and patience will inherit the promises. There needs to be a kick in our step. There needs to be something about us that we know that we've been saved for a purpose, that God has a plan for each one of our lives. And thirdly, Isaiah was to speak and write to a people who wanted to do their own thing. I come in contact with this all the time. Judges chapter 17, verse 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And I can assure you this. If Jesus Christ is not the king of your life, you will do what's right in your own eyes. It won't matter what the preacher says. It won't even matter what you read in your own Bible. You'll keep doing what you want to do. How's that working out for you? And see, I know some of our testimonies, some of our lives of how it's been turned upside down when we do what's right in our own eyes. The proverb writer says in chapter 12, verse 15, that the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. On occasion, someone will come into my study or on the telephone or just at large, and they'll say, Joel, I need some advice. And to the very best of my ability, based upon Scripture, I try to give advice. And they'll look at me sometime and go, man, I hadn't thought of it that way. Thank you so much for giving me that advice. Then they walk right out my doors and do whatever they want to do, and it winds up blowing up in their face. Now, I've got to be honest with you. That chaps my rear end, amen? I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm, I'm among family and friends here today. I, I don't understand that, that when people who are wise in certain areas speak into your life, listen to them, follow their advice, Maybe they've walked a similar path. Maybe they've stumbled a little bit. Maybe they've done some things. And you know what? Their life now consists of helping others to not make the same mistakes that they made. But you've got to be the one that's willing to do the right thing, not the easy thing. Because sometimes the hard thing and the right thing are the same. And then, of course, there's chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And I've seen that happen as well in 30 years of ministry. Individuals who say, well, emotionally, I think this is right. Or this is how this group of people believe, so I think it's right. Well, it always ends up in death. Maybe not their death, but the death of others. So just because we think it's right doesn't mean that it's right. So I've used all that as a preface to what I want to talk about today on wings like eagles. Isn't that a beautiful picture? I've always loved American bald eagles. I have pictures of them. I, I, I've got statues on my desk of eagles. It's such a majestic bird. But I do not believe it's just a coincidence that the Scriptures teach us to learn from the characteristics of the eagle. We don't learn lessons from a turkey or a chicken, and certainly not from a peacock who walks around strutting itself all the time. No, we learn from the eagle. So if you have your Bibles, your smartphone, your Kindle, or your iPad, turn with me today to the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. And while you're turning there, I want to remind you, this is probably where one of my first sermons I ever preached. And I did it at Athens Middle School in their auditorium many, many, many years ago. The Bible says, have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint grow weary his understanding is unsearchable i want you to write down the key word perseverance some of us today are, have been tempted to quit you know what this jesus stuff is getting on my last nerve and i'm just not going to do it anymore i want to encourage you to persevere 
to work through the issues and the struggles and the tensions that presently you may be going through. Why would you ask me to do that, Joel? Because of the attributes of God. First of all, being that God is infinite. He is the self-existing without origin. What does that mean, Joel? Colossians chapter 1, verse 17 says, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Even the problems that you're facing right now, even the struggle that you're presently going through, he is before all things, in him all things hold together. One of my spiritual mentors from afar was Dr. Adrian Rogers. He went home to be with Jesus a number of years ago. He wrote, the name Jehovah is used some 6,800 times in the Bible. The root of this name means self-existing, one who never came into being and one who always will be. So today, friend, no matter what you're going through, one of the attributes here is that God is infinite. Secondly, God is immutable. He never changes. You know, methods may change. More than likely before I got here, you had not done a game day as we've done it. But it's been an opportunity for us to invite friends and neighbors and family and others to come and be with us and wear the jersey or polo shirt or colors of their favorite team. And we just had a whole lot of fun with it. Methods change, but the message remains the same. The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Sam Storm said, What all this means very simply is that God is dependable. Our trust is in him. In him is therefore a confident trust, for we know that he will not, indeed cannot, change. His purposes are unfailing. His promise is unassailable. It is because the God who promised us eternal life is immutable that we may rest assured that nothing, not trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, shall separate us from the love of Christ. So nothing that you and I are going through shall separate us from the love of Christ. Oh, yes, he is immutable, but he is also omniscient. What does that mean, Joel? It means he's all-knowing. He knows what was going on in your household before you got to church this morning. Uh Uh-oh. He knows the words that we say. He knows the thoughts that we think. God is all-knowing. Look at Isaiah 46 on the screen. It says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Hmm. Some of us are going through something right now that we don't quite understand. But God's word says, I will accomplish all my purpose. And that means he accomplishes it through people like us. And even sometimes when we stumble and fall, even sometimes when we do things, say things, or in places that we should not do or be, but yet God has a purpose. He'll even take our sin and turn it into something beautiful. He'll take our tragedy and turn it into triumph. He will do things that only God can do, but you got to be willing to trust him. And you got to be willing to stay in there with him and not give up and not surrender. Notice what Tozer said. He can be everywhere at the same time. He never sleeps or slumbers. He's aware every moment of every day exactly what we are up against. He knows our way and is with us always. There's no place on this earth we can go that he doesn't see and know of. I believe that. I'm just naive enough to believe the Bible that says that our God is all-knowing. And nothing catches him by surprise. All things catch us by surprise all the time. We get blindsided with something going on in family or friends or in our job. But yet God is all-knowing. Joel... If I really believe that, then what does that mean to me? Well, first of all, there is no limit to his ability to meet your need. And, and, and a lot of us walked in here today, and there's, there's a lot of needs. Needs in our family, needs in our finances, needs in our friends, needs, needs, needs all around. But he has no limit to his ability to meet that need. Secondly, there is no limit to his provision. But I've got to be willing to trust, is that God's purpose for me? Is that God's plan for me? Or is this because of my narcissism that I think it's always all about me? I've got to be willing to trust that God does have a plan and it includes more than just me. And are we willing to trust him in that respect? 
God never gets tired. God never grows weary. And he's always ready to listen to the prayers and the petitions of his sons and daughters. When is the last time you spent some time with the Lord? Now, I'm not talking about now lay me down to sleep. That's fine for children. But I'm talking about those of us who are seemingly spiritually mature, that we have grabbed a hold of the robe of God and not let go until we've prayed through. That's what he is asking of us today. Back to Isaiah, look at verse 29 and 30. The Bible says he gives power to the faint. To him who has no might, he increases strength. Even you shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. Write down this word, key word, power. Perseverance, now power. God is omnipotent. It means he is all powerful the word omni means all potent means powerful he's able and powerful to do anything he wills but it's important to note anything he wills is part of that statement because God cannot do anything that is contradictory or contrary to his nature Notice what Job said about this and if you've never read the book of Job those 42 chapters will turn your world upside down We see a man who had everything. He had wealth, he had power, he had prestige, he had influence, he had a great family, everything. And then it was all taken away. And yet he was willing to stay the course for 40 chapters in that book. And then in the 42nd chapter, it says that he was blessed with more than he had in the beginning. You willing to walk the walk? You willing to go through the trouble? You willing to endure the trial that maybe is on your horizon? I pray so. Because but for the grace of God, every one of us have something on our horizon that right now we don't understand. Right now we don't want. But it may just be part of God's plan. Notice what Job said. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? Its measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. And if he passes through and imprisons and summons the court, who can turn him back? Job is saying God's will will be done. Even when you and I try to mess it up. Even when you and I think we know better than God does. There's a great book written a few years ago called Forward by Ron Moore. He put it like this. God's attribute of omnipotence means that God is able to do all that he desires to do. And when he plans something, it will come to be. If he purposes something, it will happen. Nothing can prevent his plan. God's decisions are always in line with his character, and he has all the power to do whatever he decides to do. You and I usually play checkers with our lives. We're only thinking about where we're going to have lunch this afternoon. God plays chess, and he's thinking 10 years out, 15 years out. And there are things that have to happen right now so that your children who will grow up and be where they're supposed to be. I believe that. Joe and I have been married 13 years. I didn't know if I was going to be a daddy or not. And then we found out we were going to have Zeke. Turned my world upside down. And I began to pray. I says, Lord, it's, it's no longer about me. It's no longer about Joe. What are we going to do to bless and benefit and, and be the parents that we're supposed to be? And then later on when we found out we were going to have Danny, it again turned our world upside down. And we realized, God, I pray that everything that happens, that there is a purpose, there is a plan, even in the midst of the struggle. Because all of us are going to go through struggle. They just vary in degrees. It's just part of what we go through as sons and daughters of Almighty God. Look at the last verse this morning, verse 31. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Such a beautiful verse of Scripture. Our key word, being alliterated from perseverance to power, we now have patience. And that's one thing that the book of Galatians has taught me over the last several months, that over and over again, Paul would use that infernal word, that we are to have patience, waiting on God. And most of us don't do that real well. We want it when we want it, and that usually is yesterday. 
But are we willing to wait for the Lord? Let me give you three things to think about. First of all, waiting for the Lord requires great faith. I was 28 years old when I got married and been praying. My mom had been praying. I dated some godly young ladies and young ladies who, who loved me. They loved the, uh, the ministry. They, they loved Jesus, all of the above. And, and I just never had peace. And I said, Lord, is this going to happen? Waiting for the Lord requires great faith. I knew that one day God was going to answer that prayer. I just wanted to help him. Amen. Just, come on, Lord, hurry up. And yet, because of patience and waiting on God, I just celebrated 25 years of marriage, trusting that the Lord knew all this in, in the beginning and, 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 and with foreknowledge, but yet I had to get with the program. I had to learn to have patience. I had to learn to say those who wait upon the Lord. But what does that mean, Joel? I've heard you say that. I've, heard what the, I've read what the Bible says. Well, it means waiting for God's timing and direction. M most of us who are now adults think that we know everything that we need to know. That we are no longer learners, we're just teachers. But see, the, the, the wisest of teachers and preachers and others that, that actually give instruction to others, they also are willing to learn. And they're also willing to wait. Today, God wants to give you some timing. God wants to give you some direction, but you've got to learn how to wait on him. Running out in front of God and saying, hey, God, come over here and bless this. Bless this relationship. Bless this business. Bless all this stuff I'm doing. That, that's not how it works. But yet, that's how we expect it to work. And you'll find that nowhere in God's word. Secondly, it means not becoming disenchanted with God when he seems to be inactive or God seems to be slow or we find ourselves plateaued or even losing ground. We've all been there. When heaven appears to be silent, when there's no word from God. And, and sometimes it's not that God is, is giving us a word directly from the clouds, but he's speaking through someone else. Sometimes it's a parent, or sometimes it's a teacher, or maybe sometimes your pastor, that God has a word for you if you're willing to listen to that word. Thirdly, it means we do our part, and then we leave the rest to God. I, I think there are situations that we all come in contact with that, yes, we must be willing to work. We can't be slothful. We can't be lazy. We've got to do what we do, and then we trust the rest to God. And then, even if we still have not heard from him, it means we keep praying. And then we seek God's help to cope with the disappointment because I'm not going to get you to raise your hand. All of us in this room have been disappointed in people. We've been disappointed in circumstances and situations. And sometimes we just need to go to our knees in prayer and fasting and ask God to help me with the disappointment that I now feel. Remember when Jesus said this in Matthew 17, 20, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you that if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Some of us are facing an impossible situation right now. We're facing an impossible task but nothing will be impossible for you, which leads us to secondly, waiting for the Lord sometimes requires going through the fire. And as your pastor, I'm aware of several of our folks that are right now walking through the fire. Recently, families that are dealing with death of a parent or someone that they love in their extended family. Remember the 23rd Psalm, verse 4? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Some of you are walking through the valley of the shadows today. It may not be a literal physical death of someone, but it could be the death of a relationship. It could be the death of a, of a job that you've had for a very long time that, that provided a living for your family and a roof over your head and food in the cupboard, but yet now you're walking through the valley of the shadows. This is a story that I learned I guess the very first time when I was at Shanghai Baptist Church as a little boy, Daniel chapter 3. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Now, why did they get in the burning, fiery furnace doing the right thing? They wouldn't bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar. They were going to do what they were supposed to do, and yet it cost them, 
and they were thrown into the fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste and he declared to his counselors, Hey, didn't we cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods now we have the benefit of knowing that was Jesus hanging out amen he was walking in the fire with Shadrach Meshach and Abednego let me tell you right now no matter what fire you're walking through if you're a child of the king Jesus is walking with it through you he is walking through it with you why because he loves you He says, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. You're not going to have to be the lone ranger in this. I will be with you. And I know sometimes we feel like we're all alone. Sometimes we're struggling. We don't know which way to turn. But look what happened. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. I think I've got a word for somebody today. You will eventually come out of the fire. You're not going to stay in it forever. The present situation that you're in, whether it be good or not so good, you're not going to stay static. You're not going to stay there. So hopefully today you've been encouraged that I am one day going to come out of the fire. I am one day going to look back at this as a learning experience. Third and finally, waiting for the Lord requires us to overcome the impossible. I love to be told, Joel, you can't do that. Been told that my whole life in a variety of different situations. Or, Joel, we've never done it that way before. Well, let's try it. That's just how I'm wired. It's how many of you are wired. But you look into God's word. Abraham, leaving his home, overcame the impossible. Sarah, having a baby in old age, overcame the impossible. Noah, building an ark in the middle of a forest, overcame the impossible. Moses, leading the children of Israel out of bondage, overcame the impossible. But our main understanding today of overcoming the impossible happened in our Savior's life 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross they put him in a borrowed tomb and on the third day he rose from the grave what happened that day he overcame the impossible and some of you right now need to have that same encouragement in your life that you will eventually overcome the impossible look what Jesus said Matthew 19 but Jesus beheld them and said unto them with men this is impossible but with God All things are possible. So here's my question in closing. What is your impossible? What has happened in your journey so far that right now you consider it will be impossible for, and then fill in the blank, something future-wise? Some of us are experiencing a broken marriage. For some, it's a broken body. It just won't do what it's supposed to do. Addiction. Alcoholism runs in your family. Drug addiction runs in your family. All this stuff runs in your family. Loneliness for our widows and widowers. That we just don't like being by ourselves, but for whatever reason, that's where we are right now. Financial ruin. This is just a sampling of what some of us are facing today. It's our impossible. But maybe it's now time to mount up with eagle's wings. It's time to run and not be weary. It's time to walk and not faint. The last 5K road race that Zeke and I ran together, he beat me by 14 minutes. What y'all laughing at? I mean, he he just scorched me. And, and, And usually now, Zeke's always waiting at the finish line. He's looking for his daddy. He's waiting for his daddy to come come into view. And when I finally am able to make some contact with him eye to eye, he's smiling real big. And I'll come in, and he's always coming up, and he'll say, Daddy, did you walk? (laughs) Of course I walked. That's why you beat me by 14 minutes. But you know what I'm learning the older I get? According to the Bible, I don't have to run all the time anymore. It's okay to walk. When you mount it with eagle's wings... You can run and not be weary, but you can also walk and not faint. And there's some of us today that need to learn how to pace. Need to learn how to pace ourselves in the journey that God has entrusted to us. I've seen a whole lot of Christians or so-called Christians burn out. 
while they were running, 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 they lost their family. Running, 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 they lost their ministry. We've got to learn how to run and walk because there is a time to run. There's also a time to walk. And when you're walking, you're still moving. You have an objective. You have a plan. God has a purpose. But maybe you can't do what you used to could do physically. It's game day. I'd, I'd love to strap on a helmet and pads one more time. But it would just be one more time. But my time has passed. My time of running has passed. Now it's time for me to walk to the stadium and watch my son. All of us are in different stages of life. We're in different seasons of life. And what you've got to be willing to do is embrace that season. But in whatever season you're in, be willing to mount it with wings as eagles. And soar and run and walk in the plan that God has given you.